Great. Uh, welcome to the panel, The Role of Purpose-Driven Business in Systems Change. It's a delight to be part of the Horasis Extraordinary meeting um, and discussing with this panel. towards really understanding um, what does it mean to build better through a purpose-driven approach to business and ecosystem engagement and private sector, public sector strategy. With me today, um, uh, it's a delight to have Nicholas Mikaelson, the Chief Executive Officer of AVA. I have Lucien Tonowski with me, the founding curator of United Planet, and I have Nizamil Abdel Karim with me, the Chief Executive Officer of the African Trade Alliance Sudan. So I welcome you to the stage and, um, and, and to answer um, the very first question in, yeah. in, light of, uh, in light of our global. Oh, and we have with us uh, Tony Cho, the CEO and uh, founder of Future of Cities, joining us here from a systemic um, perspective on the future of our economies. And we can kick this off in the following, and I really want from each of you to understand based on your experience and your work that you've been doing over the last years, what is your view really on the role of purpose-driven practices in business to take a leveraged position for systemic change, being it in your region, being it global, or in the work that you're engaged, engaged with? And I will start with Tony Cho, um, who just joined us. And um, here you go, Tony. Tell us, tell us more about the work that you're doing. Oh, thank you so much, Tantiana. It's such an incredible honor to be here with all of you. Some familiar faces. Uh, Lucien, it's a pleasure to see you uh, in, this, in this forum. Uh, and uh, it's wonderful to meet uh, everybody on the panel. Um, I had quite a bit of a challenge getting on the platform. My email was wrong, so I apologize about that for the delay. I hope I didn't uh, delay any of this incredible session. But... It's an honor to be here. My name is Tony Cho, and I'm an impact eco-entrepreneur and real estate pioneer focused on accelerating our transition to a more regenerative future through a portfolio of companies that I've started and initiatives that span from conscious fair trade artists in clothing to real estate, environmental activism and wildlife conservation and protection. I was born on in an interfaith commune in central Florida, started by my grandmother who adopted me at birth, hence community has been very central to who I am and everything that I've done in my life. Um, but today I'm most excited about, about our new venture, the future of cities, mainly because of the impact that this work has and will, will continue to have, which is a network of global leaders and experts bringing together to catalyze an amazing new regenerative era that we're all co-creating together. As the challenges cities face and that we mount, the Future of Cities was created to reimagine how we live, work, play, and learn. The FOC is a mission-driven consortium invested in transforming the built environment by adopting ESG strategies to improve the quality of, of urban living across the globe with the goal to impact 1 billion people through a new sustainable urban design logic that we're calling uh, affectionately regenerative placemaking, building upon the work of Dominique Hess and others from Regenesis, such as Bill Reed, and the co-creation of regenerative cities of the future. The FOC is a multi-pronged platform that includes real estate investment and development, a venture ecosystem, and a think tank that's really focused on public advocacy. The organization is comprised of global leaders, advisors, subject matter experts, technology partners, investors, policymakers, local municipalities and governments, leaders of nonprofit organizations, businesses and corporations that have committed to adopting strategies and a regenerative development framework that will accelerate the transition to a more sustainable urban future. I think the built environment has so much potential to transform and transition us into a regenerative future and is often the, the last to be focused on or, and it's underinvested, particularly in building methodology and material sciences. Less than 1% goes back into R&D, into material, material sciences. We're using concrete and steel to build most of the built environment, which is forecasted to double or triple over the next 30 years. So these statistics are alarming, you know, in conjunction with our climate crisis, our social inequality crisis, 
and, and, the, and the pandemic that we're now emerging from and has really created kind of a perfect storm and a fertile ground for us really to come together around a multi-pronged platform like this. So this is my life work. It's, it's super ambitious, uh, but we're getting so much support and so much validation from folks like yourself, Tatiana, and others in the space that are really primed and ready for this, what we're calling a regenesance, which I think is the era that we're en entering right now. So I'm very honored and privileged to be among such brilliant people here. Thank you, Tony. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing and, and truly going through the systemic layers and, and um, something that you've mentioned being right now in this in the storm that we all find ourselves in um, and really harnessing and understanding how can we leverage all that we have learned and done and also to understand where are now the opportunities and to the challenges to really act fast. And I know um, Ms. Amil Abdel Karim, that you also have um, a significant role to play in that in that arena. So we would love to learn from your perspective and of the African Trade Alliance. Um, there's uh, so many huge programs and projects which are just fertile to get spread and nourish um, out of Africa. We've been involved with so many incredible programs there. Could you um, set the stage for us with the work that you're doing? Well, hello, everyone. You know, good morning from Khartoum, Sudan. So I am Muzammil Abdel Karim. I am the CEO and chairman of African Trade Alliance. So basically, uh, we are an alternative asset management and investment banking firm that is combating the status quo. So what we came to see, actually, I, I come from a background that is uh, strategy operations mainly. Okay, I actually started my entrepreneurship uh, line, you know, combating problems, uh, problems with uh, segregation, problems with racism in Africa. Uh, we mm -hmm. were actually one of the first companies, or actually the first company in Sudan to bring artists all the way from the US to Sudan to actually bring together like people from all over, tribes from all over Sudan. So we're talking about a country that has over 200 tribes and over 500 dialects. Wow. Okay. So basically bringing them all together under one concert. Uh, we had people like Erinesta from the Whalers, you know, uh, rappers that people were very aware of here in Sudan. So basically from there on, it became a life mission to actually improve life for the people in Sudan. Uh, we see a lot of the disruptions in the systems that we live in right now today. Uh, disruptions that include uh, food security, climate change, uh, growing populations, economic turmoil. So we're like, okay, how are we going to come and solve this and put it together in a better manner? So what we started doing is basically reassessing, realigning, and rerouting the systems that we have today with Sudan. And essentially mm -hmm. what we're looking to do is realigning the interests of global capitalism all the way down to wealth creation in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, so these uh, solutions and innovations that we brought through through our alternative asset management and uh, investment banking solutions. And basically through merging uh, capitalism and wealth creation in Africa, it became what we call our global solution to basically tackle increasing, decreasing yields of resources around the world, uh, problems with uh, uh, profitability, uh, et cetera. So what we see today is basically a very flourishing stock market, but the reality in life is that the economy is not looking anywhere close to that stock market that is flourishing today. So yeah. then, that there's a lot of trouble that we're seeing today with a lot of people losing jobs, a lot of capitalism going down the drain. Uh, COVID, which is basically became a test of time to a lot of businesses today, even for, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, purpose businesses, purpose driven yes. businesses. Cause we see a lot of people that were actually claiming that they were purpose driven businesses, but COVID came and actually put them to the test. So mm. the, people are very aware nowadays more than ever of what their rights are, what they're going through. And one of them is GameStop. GameStop was evident to basically people coming together and fighting the system. But the, per the people that actually were there and actually saying that they were purpose driven and going and democratizing finance, what happened when they, the rough got proper? Basically, they went and turned their back on these people. Mm. So it was a very life test to see how people would go through after the COVID. And I believe that it yes. is only purpose driven businesses that would make it through. So basically this is our business today. What we're doing is basically bringing a new solution or a new system that is a parallel to the current system 
that basically is the right thing to do for everyone. Yes. Thank you so much. And um, we, we, we hear you and it is, um, it is such a significant debate, exactly to your point. We also say this is now the test of a purpose-driven organization, but also the ecosystem, something that also Tony mentioned, right? Where, where are the leverage points? What are, what is the recommendations for policy? Where do our stakeholders come together so we can unblock and unlock and move together towards um, understanding the mechanisms, how to um, align profit and purpose and create value for a society, planet and the organization, which should be, this should be the, the way of, of, of wealth creation. And, um, and, and it's also highly tied to systems engineering and community. So Lucien uh, Tarnowski, I would love for you to tell us about uh, the incredible work that you're doing. Thank you, Tatiana, and, and such an honor to be here. Thank you for having me and um, in, in esteemed company. Um, you know, the band is getting back together here. Uh, so yeah, my name is Lucien Tarnowski. I'm a um, British entrepreneur, but been based in San Francisco the last, uh, the last almost decade and now in Ibiza, which is the, uh, uh, we think one of the best places to prototype systems change in the micro. Um, and, um, yeah, so I, I, uh, a year ago, almost this week, actually, a year ago, we launched United Planet which was really a response to COVID. We launched it the very day the lockdowns began. And um, it'd been something I'd been thinking about for a while as a storytelling platform, really as a, as a, a game, a new world game, as the great futurist Buckminster Fuller called it, uh, um, where, where we come together to envision the future we wish to live in, a future that works for all, a future that's win for all, a future where uh, all life can thrive. And, um, and, and really, we're in a time where there's, we've really got no excuse not to shoot for the sidelines, not to aim for the stars. Um, you know, every aspect of the system around us has been designed by other people. Therefore, it can be changed. And so what we realized, having I had spent about uh, 10 years of my career designing communities focused on systems change all around peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing, I basically realized that we're still missing uh, the narrative, the, the story that is what we are collectively aiming towards. You know, the SDGs are the best we've got and they're great, you know, not to knock them. But as a dear friend of mine put it, they're a little bit like putting salad on the uh, McDonald's menu. You know, they're, they're the exhaust pipe of the existing system and they're not fundamentally addressing the root causes of poverty, of hunger, of the issues that we have that are raised by the SDGs. And so what we did with United Planet was um, create essentially a envisioning engine or a game where we bring experts from around the world together, both online and here in person in, in Ibiza right now, to, uh, to envision the world we wish to have in 2030. And we do that not just generally the world we want to have. We have 16 different leagues that is basically like a systematic approach to systems change. And each of the 16 leagues represent one of the sustainable development goals. And we bring teams of 12. Our goal is to get up to 12 teams of 12 to come together through this like immersive experience that's focused on your self mastery as much as it is our collective potential as a society to, to uh, re essentially remember the future, to envision the best possible version of the future, and then from that place, reverse engineer that scenario into the present moment. Because what we found is it's very difficult. We're kind of having a crisis of hope right now. It's very difficult for people to envision, like, what do we want to get to from the current status quo of all of the problems we have? It's like, it's, it, it's, it's almost numbing. It's like too complex for any individual to be able to see the path through. And so our experiment is like, well, what if we start with where we want to go and then reverse engineer from that place? And so, you know, I, I, I see the role of businesses and purpose-driven businesses starting with, what is your story from 2030 backwards? And, and as a company is thinking about their own transition to a regenerative world, to what Tony described as the regenaissance, 
uh, as they're thinking about their role and participation in that. Because frankly, if as a business, if you're still based on extractive uh, principles, you don't deserve to be in business in 2030. And so I think every company needs to make this um, journey towards purpose-driven, uh, a purpose-driven approach, and, uh, and and a world where they're contributing to the, the to the collective potential of our, our society. And we see this immersive experience into the future we wish to create as one of the best ways that can shape an organization's strategy in the here and now. Um, so it's a bit like writing your press release from the future, like what you're going to do, but it's much more immersive into applied collective intelligence. And um, a little bit about my background, um, just to finish this off, I, I, I spent um, 10 years designing knowledge sharing communities for organizations like GE, Genentech, Lockheed, Mercer, all around like societal issues from healthcare reform to education reform. And um, it was from that that I realized that there's a, um, that, the, the, that we're living in the golden decade and we're living in a time where the greatest story ever told can happen over this, the, these, these, this next decade. And um, it's an honor to be here and, um, and thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa Antonovsky, so much for for your view and your incredible work that you are doing. Um, and to your point, this is something that I think we have very much in common in this group when we talk about the SDGs. Of course, they are significant and they're important right now. We need to solve, but we need to go into the root causes because the SDGs are the symptoms of the extractive system that we've been living in, right? It should not be an aspiration that we have just no hunger, desperation should be abundance for all and thriving. Um, and uh, to to um, Nicholas Mikaelson, uh, Chief Executive Officer of ABA, based on, on the work that you're doing from, from the systemic investment side, we know this is exactly the target, the, the target assets that um, you try to crystallize and have been working on over the past couple of years. Can you please um, share more about what you're doing? You're, you're muted. Oh, you're muted. We can't hear you right now. Do I have to drop the mic? <laughs> <laughs> I no. gave I gave you the mic, Tony, so I could I, I think I could take it back. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. Maybe uh, maybe Nico, you need to sign out and sign back in again. Because at the very beginning then it gives you the permission to, to open your mic. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, yeah. then we wait for, for Nico to come back, but um it, it's it's very evident that it needs a new, much deeper rooted view. And this is what COVID showed us and tested also purpose driven business, tested the ecosystem, stakeholder involvement, but it also connected us really on a very human level everywhere in the world, how connected we are. And for us to understand what are the steps now to move forward, what are the challenges and opportunities that we learned we need to address. What about Nico, now? can we hear you? Yes. Yeah. Yes, fantastic. Brilliant. It's okay. perfect timing. So yes. please share about uh, the work that you're doing with us. Yes, for sure. So, so first off, thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Um, and you know, really, I'm also in the reverse engineering business uh, <laughs> in the same way as as Lucian, in the sense that um, what we do is we we try to establish what is the future state of our economies and our cities and our different systems and then reverse engineer that into investable assets. So, so fundamentally, we're a, we're a multi-strategy investment firm that enable institutional, sovereign, and corporate investors to invest in net positive outcomes at scale. Um, and we do this utilizing a uh, assistance-based approach where we um, can accelerate financial, environmental, and social objectives simultaneously um, because there tends to be... Um, uh, 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 there's a tendency to focus on one at the expense of the others. And so what, what we focus on is trying to do all of them at the same time. So our process is, is uh, quite straightforward in the sense that 
we start with what is the status quo we're in today? What is the state we want to be in? And how do we map the pathways between the two states? And in that process of mapping the system, as we call it, we identify the leverage points, meaning that certain actions, companies, uh, uh, strategies will be more effectful than others at driving that transition. And once we've established how to reverse engineer the outcomes that we want to drive, we then translate that into investable assets. Because one of the biggest challenges that has happened over the last well, many years, that despite we have about $40 trillion uh, worth of ESG, ESG managed assets, uh, impact investing is only still about seven, uh, 700 billion, right? So it's, it's a drop in the ocean. And the reason for that is that people tend to look at this as an, as a separate asset class. And what we are sort of in the business of, of, of doing and proving is that it's not a separate asset class. Everything is impactful. It is just whether you manage it or not. So, uh, this is why bringing impact to scale is what it's is at the core of our uh, of our uh, of our mission and the work that um, that we do um, and you know it's not just about identifying assets and companies and investing in them it's also about the diffusion into the wider uh, financial system that we have so we have a lot of the technologies that we need to a large extent it is actually at this point more about diffusion so one thing that I loved about what you were saying as well, uh, Tony, is this notion of working in consortia, in working in aligned, with aligned stakeholders from all different parts of the system. So that could be other investors. It could be government uh, leaders. It could be uh, uh, affected communities. Um, it doesn't really matter. But it's this notion that we're coming together in order to co-create. And we all have a vested interest in seeing this macro outcome come to fruition. And the way, the way that I tend to think about systems change is that it happens at an actor or a bottoms up level, meaning we can't go from the top down and say, we need to fix all these big problems. It's more like we need to go from the individual's perspective and saying, what are the challenges I have in my day to day if I'm a pension fund manager? How do I make sure that I can actually be able to pay out the pensions of my constituents when that time comes? Um, how can I, as a sovereign wealth uh, fund manager, make sure that I align certain strategic uh, um, uh, perspectives with my investments as well? And in solving for them, we also solve for a systemic outcome at, this, at the systems level. And my, my background is um, in the technology space. Uh, I built uh, one of the biggest consumer rights AI companies in the world. And one of the things that I noticed once I sort of stepped over into the other, uh, to the other side of the, the table was that a lot of the companies and a lot of the things that were being focused on were solving the symptoms. Um, so coming back to this notion of the SDGs being symptoms and not necessarily the root causes. So this learning journey that I went on personally was that um, fundamentally we need to reimagine how we invest. And it's not about just the, the vehicles and the strategies. It's also the mindset in which we go in because there tends to be a lot of siloing of I'm an environmental investor, so I focus on, on environmental uh, companies or I'm a health investor, so I focus on health companies. And the truth of the matter is that our systems are interlinked and they're deeply broken. So the problems tend to skip between the different economic system, which means that, for instance, in the food system, which generates about $10 trillion worth of value each year, it costs about $12 trillion, which meaning that me would means that we have a deficit of about $2 trillion in our food systems alone. And the reason this happens is because the costs are not attributed back. So the cost exists, it exists within health uh, in terms of obesity, cardiovascular disease, et cetera. It exists within social uh, challenges uh, and it's, it's, it exists within environmental challenges. So it's never attributed back to where the problem was first created. And, and that is a long-winded way of coming to the point that 
the one thing that we are trying to do is we're trying to stitch together these different silos so that we can have the systemic effect that I think we all uh, uh, recognize the need for. Thank you. Thank you, Nico, so much um, of, of pointing really to the leverage points from from this significant, you really go very deep into the root causes. And, um, and it's something we, we very strongly believe that once corporations, communities, cities, um, regions, countries, really try to navigate, to, to manage to bring this mindset together for a value creation for a thriving society. These are then the challenges and opportunities that we need to address, talk about and find solutions for together. And uh, Muzamil, I've been seeing that you, you raised your hand and wanted to answer to that based from your perspective and thinking about the leverage points of, based from your work, what would you say are the most significant and crucial opportunities once unlocked to unleash a systemic change in, in the work that you're doing? Uh, well, basically, uh, I really enjoyed your talk, by the way, and the work that you're doing in asset management. So basically, uh, just coming back to what we're doing here in Africa, one of the big opportunities that we see, I believe people are more uh, flexible to change today more than ever. And this is an opportunity that we must be taking over uh, to basically start influencing the systems that are currently uh, in place. And the reason for that is because aside from all the errors and disruptions that we've seen in the system lately from uh, COVID and we've seen every day and COVID hasn't ended yet, even though people would like to think that uh, it's ended and it's all well and good, but every day we see new strains coming out. So it's basically a new test every single day, not only on the people, but on the businesses themselves. So basically now is an opportunity to come and again, I'm not being biased here, but Africa currently is one of the big solutions for this because it's a greenfield country. Okay. Uh, so if it's a greenfield country, then where we start in Africa is basically every other fault that happened in the first world. We're going to start here fresh, but with all the lessons learned from the first world and avoiding all the mistakes that have already happened there. So basically, then it's a blueprint for the ideal or utopian uh, system that could be built uh, for better behavior, better solutions that would serve purpose all the way down to the people. And then we need to agree on something here, that systems do not change systems. It's people that change systems. Yes. But for people to change systems, then how are we going to motivate them to do that if they don't have purpose? Okay. So purpose is the drive to actually make people get out of their way and have radical change inside of themselves, the way that they deal with things, the way that they do their work, and actually start following one certain purpose and be the motive and driver of performance of every single day to actually achieve these motives. So everyone here is talking about reverse engineering, looking at the future and coming back. So this is then a purpose, okay? People are looking at the future. They want to achieve that. Okay, and then coming back at it. But how do we make other people buy into this purpose right now? And yeah. basically, it is about you're going to have this, the, the naysayers, okay, which are a lot, okay? Uh, and these are people that have been around for a very long time doing the same thing, and it's actually worked for them very well. Uh, and they don't really enjoy the change that we might be bringing to them, whether it's the reverse engineering, whether it's the solutions, whether it's the new ideas, AI, etc. So basically then we need, we cannot basically roadblock them, but we need to accept them and understand what their, their problems are right now. What, what are like validate their, their, their issues, their problems, and et cetera, and actually make them part of the solution itself and bring them in. Cause like they said, everyone needs to be a part of the solution for the system to work. We cannot be looking at the system as certain targets, but we need to look at the big picture. And looking at the big picture, then we need to involve everyone in that big picture and actually create a blueprint that works. And through creating a blueprint that works, that would actually bring in, you know, or buy in the, the support of a lot more people to come and join that system. Yes, uh, thank you so much. And, and this is uh, so well um, articulated and, and showing the experience that you have from the ground. And, and we've heard some so many, we've seen so many programs and so much incredible work being done. And um, 
in in Africa, but also in the in the connection to your point in in terms of what does it mean to bring people in, what does it mean to bring constituencies in from very various communities and into something which is right now existing, getting the buy-in to move towards the future. And I know, Tony, this has been. Um, for you on the ground um, in the cities, in the regions that you've been working on, you've been navigating this space really on a daily basis. And um, from your perspective and building on what um, Wuzamil just shared with us, what what would you argue, from, what do you feel and see right now are the most crucial opportunities really to be unlocked, to move forward at scale and to harness a purpose-driven centered um, perspective to business for, for greater change? Well, Tatiana and everybody, I mean, I couldn't be more aligned with, you know, you know, reverse engineering the future, but really it's about co-creating that vision that we can all align, you know, with. And I think part of the problem is that so many of these issues are so overwhelming to the average person in the world who's dealing with day-to-day -day problems, you know, food security, water security, health security, all of these, 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 these issues that everybody's dealing with. And so I think you know, part of the issue that we're, we're, we're facing is, is a crisis in trust. You know, there's the fake news issue, there's trust. And I think, you know, trust building is critical between the public sector, the private sector, government, in order to accelerate the change. You know, it happens at the speed of trust, as a colleague of mine always said, you know, success happens at the speed of trust. And I think we need to reverse that. And I think we can do that aligning around a future that we all want to co-create together. And it's not about being prescriptive. You know, our regenerative placemaking framework is really about providing and giving capacity to communities to co-design their best outcomes. And by leveraging the technologies and, this, and, the, and the tools that are there, like Buckminster Fuller said, all of the tools and, and the science and the technology exists if we harness it and direct it into the right places. And I think that's our decision. Humans got us into this situation and humans are going to have to get us out of this situation collectively. So it is a very, you know, daunting as well as exciting decade and, and several decades in front of us, provided we can align around, you know, these issues. My work, my life's work has been predominantly in revitalizing underserved uh, communities, particularly black and brown communities within South Florida, the Wynwood Arts District, the Little Haiti and the Magic City Innovation District, and there is just a lot of distrust there. Someone like myself who grew up in a very diverse, uh, multicultural, uh, progressive commune, you know, still is seen by the color of my skin. And I still have white privilege because of the color of my skin. And so dealing with black and brown communities, there is going to be distrust that I'm not going to be able to fix myself. I'm going to do my part. But it takes a lot of trust building and bridge building, you know, on the ground. And it's great to be at these high level conferences, but the work is done at the ground, you know, and creating these kind of what I, I call living laboratories. So each one of our projects we look at as a living laboratory where we're not going to solve all the world's challenges, but hopefully we can prototype a few best practices and ideas that we co-design with that community while respecting the rights of nature and the people who came before the existing community that's there. Because many people, the indigenous came before them, the plants and animals had been pre-existing before them. And we have to take all that into consideration when we're evaluating the health and vibrancy of a community, of a city, or a region. So in addition to building trust, there's just an education campaign that's, that, happen, that needs to happen. We have to open source and share projects and show successes of what is working so that we can scale these solutions so that governments and corporations and you know foundations and everybody can come together to adopt these and at least prototype it and get away from the old paradigm of this is my IP, this is my solution. No, it's humanity's solution. And there will be enough you know, abundance for everybody if we solve these problems. There's no reason why a billion people should go to sleep hungry or without food or water or without healthcare. It's irresponsible, it's callous, and it just doesn't represent who we are in our human capacity to really accomplish great things. And I, I strongly believe that. I know the solutions are there. I just think that the incentives are misaligned. And I think the current framework of capitalism doesn't take into, into consideration the environmental and social externalities that it impacts. And I don't necessarily think that we need to completely dismantle everything. I think we need to evolve it. And I think we need to prototype and try new solutions. And then after education, I really think that 
cross-sector collaboration is just key. Sharing of knowledge, best practices, getting away from the me economy and working towards the we economy and everybody working together. And I see it happening at light speeds now. I mean, we just saw the announcement of one of the largest pension funds that committed to going net zero in their entire It could, it could accelerate gentrification and make things work if it's, if it's done in an unconscious, unthoughtful way. But with the proper guardrails and with the proper collaboration with the public sector, we can accelerate the transformation of these, these neglected urban areas and create vibrant, you know, thriving communities, particularly for, for underserved communities and black and brown communities within the United States in a very short period of time. Within 10 years, there is an opportunity for us really to reverse a lot of what's happened that has created and accelerated, you know, social inequality and division and things that have really created, created a lot of problems in this country. So there are tools out there. There are incentives, but people are unaware of them. They're uneducated. And I've been studying these things. And the more I learn about it, the more I learn that very few people have the knowledge or have the expertise. And so my mission is to share the little that I know with as many people as I can possibly share and really open source. I'm not calling it a blueprint because I think, you know, designing communities is so sensitive and it has to be co-evolutionary. You can't be prescriptive and say, this worked in Detroit, so therefore it should work in Berlin or it should work here. No, there are different examples of success stories or of technologies or of prototypes or of systems or blockchain communities or things that are working. Share those examples with the local team that's really co-creating there and co-designing and let them implement what makes the most sense. So it's much more of a participatory, inclusive sharing of knowledge that I think really is our path forward towards coherence and accelerating this transition to a regenerative future. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, for, for summing this so powerfully up and pointing also out really the significant role of asset allocation, um, community building from the ground, but linking it to the global agenda through stakeholder collaboration in a, in a newly informed way. It's nothing new to your point um, that we are looking for stronger cross-sectoral collaboration, um, but it is a evolution that we need to take very seriously since we are now very strategically looking at systemic levers that we can 